Good evening, everyone, and welcome to an event uh, from the Royal Society of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh Science Festival. And it's on a subject which, of course, is absolutely central to the discussion of scientific matters, the scientific process, all the things we've been hearing about in the course of the pandemic, about truth and falsehood, but it's also a subject, as you will all know, that spreads far beyond the boundaries of, of science, scientific research, and the public dissemination of scientific fact to really the whole culture in which we live. Truth, alternative truth, whether it's in politics, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in any field of life. But as part of the Science Festival, we're delighted to introduce this subject about truth, conspiracies, fake news, and false scientific information in the context of the dissemination of scientific fact, with which I think so many people have become used for the first time in the last 18 months, whether it's about the discussion of risk, whether it's about whether to believe one particular fact or another, and of course, the ultimate question, what is a fact? And we're going to have a discussion for about an hour in which I hope all of you who are joining on this webinar, which incidentally will be recorded, uh, are welcome to participate. You will have about half an hour from six o'clock to question the participants in this discussion, whom I'll introduce now. Mariana Spring is specialist disinformation and social media reporter. There's a title for you for BBC News. Uh, Professor Linda Bold, uh, fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Bruce and John Usher, Chair in Public Health in the Usher Institute at the College of Medicine at the University of Edinburgh, and Peter McCall, who's described sometimes as policy and future leaders leader, but the thing about Peter is that he's particularly interested in the effect of social media and the dissemination of factual information and the discussion that follows from that. We all know that in an increasingly connected online world, the social media function which plays such a part in so many people's lives has become a very very important influence in how we digest information and what we make of it that's where most people increasingly get their information twitter facebook and so on of course uh, the consequence of this opening up of discussion is that it's very easy for people to disappear into their own silos where they only listen or engage with people who share their point of view and they often close themselves up rather than open themselves out to the um, influence of an alternative view and these are some of the points that I think will uh, come up in our discussion over the next hour. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome our guests I think Mariana will be joining us at the moment and I'll begin by asking them to just give us um, a few moments of thought on this subject before we get into a discussion. Professor Linda Bold, can I ask you to begin and just give us some thoughts about how you approach this tangled but very, very different, difficult subject? Thanks, Jim. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to this. I think it's an important topic at the current time. So pre-pandemic, most of my work was on non-communicable diseases, preventing chronic diseases like cancer and looking at behavioral factors and particularly things like uh, nicotine and tobacco on alcohol and food and working in those areas, which are areas that are of, of interest to the press and to the public. They're easily accessible. They affect people's daily lives. Throughout my career, I've come into contact with what is really misinformation about those issues. The debate about was secondhand smoke harmful? Is a little bit of alcohol good for you? You know, are will e -cigarette, are e cigarettes as bad as smoking? These are all issues that I've had to grapple with. But obviously, over the last 15 months, it's been um, unusual in terms of how we've seen misinformation about, first of all, COVID 19 as a disease. And then, secondly, the vaccines, which of course is what many of us are focusing on now. And just in relation to the first, there are lots of theories, quite genuine questions about how this disease originated, where the virus came from. Everybody's seen that in the press. But also the extent to which the measures that governments were taking were underpinned by evidence. And I guess I've come into contact probably for the first time in my career with a huge backlash from a range of organizations putting forward ideas that I think Marianne will speak about fit 
what we know from the literature, some very traditional approaches to misinformation. And in relation to vaccines, I get emails every day from members of the public asking me genuine questions and then others putting forward theories about the fact that the vaccines are a conspiracy to harm people or that there are myths about them, whether there be metal in them and they cause people to be magnetic, whether they harm your fertility, whether they might have long-term damaging consequences, whether they harm children, etc. And I just wanted to reflect on some work, finally, Jim, that we did with this British Society and also looking at work that the Wellcome Trust had done and others. And we're giving, we're awarding the Edinburgh Medal at the end of this week to Heidi Larson, who's a leader in this field. And if you look at her writing and others, there's really, I guess, five things that are linked to some of the vaccine misinformation, which I know Marianne and, and Peter will speak to. They're based on key principles, distrust of science and selective use of expert authority, often distrust in pharmaceutical companies and government, simplistic explanations, use of emotion and anecdotes to affect or impact rational decision making, and the development of information bubbles and echo chambers. And I'm sure we'll touch on all of those. Thanks. Uh, Linda, thank you very much for that. Mariana, welcome to you. And I'm going to ask you to come after Peter, simply because you're just kind of settling down. And look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Peter, just picking up from what Linda was saying there uh, about where things stand after the experience of the pandemic, as somebody who's been interested in the impact of social media and the question of, you know, rational discussion over a long time, how do you see it? So I, I think I'm involved in a project that the Young Academy of Scotland has been running on rational debate, being responsible in debate. And I think there are a couple of really interesting things that have emerged all the way through the, uh, the pandemic. And I, I, mean, I think the, the first thing to note is that it's not just what we might consider to be traditional scientific knowledge that's, uh, that's been problematic. It's social scientific knowledge as well. And I think there's a, there's a really significant element here. I think the biggest mistake made by certainly the British government was uh, a misunderstanding of social science in which they took a concept of behavioural fatigue and applied it to lockdowns in a way that no expert would have done in, in that area. And that led to a delay in lockdown and potentially the loss of, of a large number of lives. And I think it's really interesting that the deployment of, of a concept that uh, really had very little evidence behind it was taken up so aggressively. And it, it shows that misunderstandings are not just something that people in the population fall for, decision makers sometimes fall for it as well. And I think that's a really important element. The second element that I think is really interesting here is the degree of vaccine hesitancy amongst underprivileged groups. And what we see is a, 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 an, an enormous extent to which communities who traditionally have little faith in authority have been hesitant about vaccines. And it's really, really important that we understand that. One of, I think, the really important connections to fake news and conspiracies is that one of the, the real underpinning dynamics that, that makes people believe in conspiracies is high levels of anxiety and high levels of inequality in society. So right back at the origins of modern conspiracy theories, there's a, there's a thing that some of you may have come across called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a very odd publication in which a lot of the anti-Semitic tropes that we now see originate. And that comes out of Tsarist Russia, possibly the most unequal society in history, and one in which those sorts of conspiracies thrive. So, so as we see increasing levels of inequality, as we see people distant from power, so we see them becoming more likely to engage in conspiracies and to believe in conspiracies. And so I think we're, it's really incumbent upon us to try and make sure that everybody has an understanding of what the reality of, of the, the policy prescriptions that they're taking from uh, scientific knowledge and social scientific knowledge, that it's really important that we try to build a more equal society because that's the society in which we can, we can best deliver the health outcomes that we want and also a whole range of other social outcomes that we might want. 
Mariana, in your professional life at the BBC, you're looking at this whole side of life, uh, which has become so important, uh, not just in science vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, but in politics too, and in the general way we conduct our public discourse. What are your reflections on where we are in this and why is it so important? It's one of the reasons that I'm late and I'm very sorry for being a bit late because I'm currently working on a report about this. The conspiracy movement that has sprung up online during the pandemic in particular and the impact that's had on individuals, but also the collective movements that have grown out of that and continue to grow despite the fact that to many life starting to or at least we hope, get a bit more back to normal. You can go to the pub, you can do lots of things, but yet we still see protesters on the streets really quite angry and quite aggressive, as, as we did at the weekend, protesting against freedom. But these protests are frequently infected by online conspiracy theories from the suggestion that Bill Gates is looking to deliberately kill or harm people with a vaccine to broader claims about COVID being a hoax. Much of my focus during the pandemic has been on the real world consequences of these online conspiracies. And more so than ever, we've seen the harm that they can cause to individuals, whether that's the harm they cause to personal relationships or the harm that they cause to the broader public. I've interviewed people who've lost loved ones because they didn't think that COVID was uh, serious. They thought it was caused by 5G. And I've interviewed people who were scared off the jab by really scary videos that were forwarded to them on WhatsApp showing people who brandish expertise or alleged medical credentials and then go on to tell them falsely that the vaccine will cause them deliberate harm or make them infertile. And, and watching those tactics evolve has certainly been part of what I do in investigating the people who uh, spread this stuff, whether it's to grow their followings or to increase their, their political power. In the age of social media and influencers, you can do quite a lot when you get a big following and post lots of very polarizing stuff mm -hmm. on social media. I think that what stays with me and still feels relevant, as relevant, perhaps more relevant now than it even did a year ago, are all of those people I interview whose lives have been changed by stuff that they are seeing on Facebook or Instagram or Telegram, uh, which is a really popular messaging app. This is, this by, by no means this has had a huge real life impact and it also leaves a legacy. Um, what happens to this COVID conspiracy movement? A lot of those who are a part of it have fallen very deep into these conspiracy theories, which have connected with others. QAnon, which we saw mm. the consequences of in the US at the beginning of this year and around the election. Violence inspired at Capitol Hill by a lot of false conspiracy theories that were shared on social media, as well as claims without evidence about rigged elections. At this protest on Saturday, which I attended, there were people with Trump 2024 flags. There were people with QAnon banners merged with people who also said that COVID isn't real and that the vaccines are part of this sinister plot. Mm -hmm. We're seeing this conspiracy movement grow and thrive. And the worry is, where does it go next? Do people become more extreme? Does it become more violent? And that's th those are all the really concerning elements of the real world impact this can have. Well, that's very interesting. I'm going to come to you first and just following this up for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes before we open it to questions, which are already coming in. And Mariana, the interesting, one of the interesting points you made there, one of several, was that, of course, it's quite often the case that people who promulgate this have, frankly, quite apart from the lure of power and being able to influence people, have got a financial aspect to it too. I mean, if you are Donald Trump, and you discover in 2016 that there are a lot of people who believe things that you do not believe at all, you're quite happy to go up there and peddle them because you can create a movement. And I think there are many people who have been close to Trump at one point or another and regretted it, who've now written about it, who say they don't think he believes any of this stuff. It's a bit like Rupert Murdoch used to say of Roger Ailes, who ran Fox News, which was very successful for Murdoch, Murdoch said, well, the trouble with Roger is he believes this crap. Murdoch doesn't believe it for a moment. But if it makes sense and it makes money, they'll do it. And that's really, you must see from where you sit and go into these demos and so on. That's the really dangerous aspect of it. There are people who say, well, if it works and it gets people on the street, I will do it. Definitely. The thing that is the most worrying, I find, when I'm interviewing people, when I'm doing my reporting, is how people deliberately exploit 
concerns, fears, distrust of certain communities in a bid to spread harmful conspiracies that they benefit from, whether it's because they are selling remedies on their YouTube channel or because they want to gain politically. They do this with intentions of gaining personally, but the people who fall victim to this stuff, they are the ones that suffer and others then suffer as a consequence of them becoming effectively radicalized by well, these conspiracy theories. It's exactly the point, uh, Mariana, that Peter was making. I think, I think just before you joined us, and Peter, you were talking about inequalities and so on. Well, we can all talk about inequalities in society, but in this context, there's a very important point that some of the people who promulgate you know, deliberately false information, which they may or may not believe themselves, are doing it in order to exploit people who are in a position where they feel powerless and therefore are susceptible to it. Com completely. People often ask me, if I had a, a penny for every time someone asked me, who believes this stuff? I would be a very rich person. Yeah. Um, and I'm asked time and time again, who believes this stuff? And the common attribute, the one thing that I find everybody who falls victim to this stuff shares is that they are deeply distrustful. It's not that they are gullible. It, it's much more about disinformation well, online that exploits those pre-existing concerns they have, whether they've experienced racism or they've lived in poverty or they, the system has not benefited them. So why would they trust it? And when these people come and exploit that fear and those concerns, of course, they're successful well, or at least have more success. Thank you. Uh, Peter, let me bring you back in at this point before I come back to Linda. And it, it's to make this point that uh, the point that Mariana is making there is that we're talking here in the context of the Science Festival of disinformation and you know, lack of clarity, perhaps, in some of the scientific discussion that we've had. But of course, it all goes back to a feeling of powerlessness or distance, however we describe it, that has other roots as well. Uh, you know, if you feel politically alienated, then you are going to be more prey to people who say, don't believe that, because it comes from them. So there's an absolutely fascinating study of vaccine denial in the yoga industry and I, I, th I think this is really interesting so in lockdown a lot of uh, yoga practitioners who have their own studios were stopped from uh, basically getting access to their own livelihood so they weren't able to teach the classes that they were using to create an income and when you do that to a group of people who already have access to a lot of social media, so they tend to be very online. And you say you have to stop doing yoga, which is a thing that's good for your health, because there's this other thing that's even that's really bad for your health. You create a situation where those people are much, much more susceptible to stories about how the virus COVID was created in order to the government to control you to destroy independent business, all of these sorts of things. And I, and I mean, this has a much longer lineage going back to sort of the early 1990s. And there's a, there's a guy called Alex Jones who had a, had a show called Infowars. I'm afraid he's still at it. I'm afraid he's still at it. Well, well I, mean, I, I mean, interestingly, he's been banned from most of the social media, which has enormously weakened his position. And I think that's a really interesting lesson. I, I mean, his argument from 9-11 onwards was that the government was creating these situations in order to control you. And that, that's a, it's a kind of analysis that you can drop on a, almost any situation. And I mean, so when Alex Jones kind of came unstuck, he was greatly supported by Trump, who said he should have got a Pulitzer Prize for services to journalism, was when he tried to argue that some of the parents of children who were shot dead at the Sandy Hook massacre had made it up as part of a government conspiracy. And these parents who had attended the funerals of their own children were naturally a little discomforted by that. Yes, I, I mean, he claimed that they were paid actors because the truth of uh, what had happened at Sandy Hook could not fit into his, his business model, actually. And I mean, he became very wealthy not in the normal way that a, that a journalist does, but he became wealthy by selling people assault rifles, ammunition, and other things that they might need to resist the government. Can I just, I want to bring, Linda, are you still there? Are you picture has disappeared. But yes, you are. Good. I want to ask you whether you see a line here. I want to talk to you in a moment about the understanding of risk, because I think there is, if you're looking for pluses in the COVID horror, 
it seems to me that there has been a public discussion about risk, you know, about how you how you manage statistical probabilities, which is much more subtle than one we've ever had before. That, you know, nothing is 100% on the other hand if it's 90% and so on. And the, the kind of things that, you know, Professor Spiegelhalter at Cambridge has been doing is much more in the public domain than it used to be. But do you see a link here going back to the MMR vaccine? And that, you know, which turned out to be based, the scare about that vaccine was based on research, which was subsequently pretty well demonstrated to be dodgy. And yet there are people who became utterly convinced. And this seems, that seems to have almost been a kind of forerunner for this. I think it has been a forerunner. And if you, as you'll be aware, Jim, that was one of the reasons why the Science Media Centre was established on the back of the MMR. For those who don't know the Science Media Centre, it's a, an organisation that works with scientists and researchers to bridge the gap between them and journalists so that journalists can ask questions, scientists can give their comment on new studies and more information is shared. And that clearly came out of MMR. So I think there are some similarities. A couple of things about that case, of course, is that that paper was published in The Lancet, which is a, you know, a mm. highly esteemed journal. So you had at the beginning a, a scientific community that through failings of peer review and other things, you know, re regarding those results perhaps as credible. And then obviously uh, the media taking them up and, and then the harm that we saw that uh, went with that. And of course, the, the author of the paper is still, you know, engaged not so much in that debate, but, but in other topics where I, I don't think it's been so helpful. So there are definitely some similarities. And I also think that with vaccines generally, there are, and I'm sure Marianne can speak to this if she's still able to join us. There are an, a series of common themes, uh, Jim, that go back well before where we are now. If you look at the development of the smallpox vaccine, one of the arguments at that point was that it's unnatural to use something that's come from a cow and to provide it to humans because it will create a cow-human hybrid. You know, this was written about in the 1800s and the equivalent today is that vaccines will alter your DNA. You know, this is a reason Yes. So there are the, there are these long standing themes, and I think we've seen that with with vaccines consistently. And I think MMR is a really cautionary tale. The other thing, your first point, just briefly, is on quantifying risk. And I think that there are many scientists who are engaged in trying to do that in an accessible way to the public, but it's still very difficult to communicate it. And just back to vaccines, a lot of People who are actually part of the anti-vaccine movement will say, I'm not anti-vaccines, I just want a safe vaccine. And they're using that as an argument essentially to argue that something has to have 100% safety. And there are very few things in life that are safe. And those of us that have worked in harm reduction for years still struggle to get that message across. So all these things are tied up together. And Peter, uh, before we open this up to questions uh, in a few minutes, I just want to to put it to you that if you're going to tackle the problems that Linda's outlined and Mariana talked about a few moments ago, I think she's had to leave us. It, it really involves, it involves leadership. And the point that Linda just made was that of course, if you're a medical scientist or an epidemiologist or whatever it is working in that field, you're not paid to be a communicator. I mean, you might be very good at it, or you might not be very good at it, but it doesn't, doesn't affect whether you're a decent scientist and, and analyst of the data or not. But, but if you're going to tackle this kind of thing, assuming we think that tackling it is important, you, you actually need people who will stand up and articulate the kind of concerns that we're discussing around the, the virtual table here and actually go for it and not just say, oh, well, of course, people are entitled to their view and so on. And it requires public leadership, doesn't it? Yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think, I mean, I think it's been interesting that as Trump has been silenced, so some of these concerns have become less because he was certainly providing leadership, but leadership in the wrong direction. And I, and I think it's really, really important that we, we do have that sort of leadership. One of the things I would say is that we have this huge problem with social media where uh, the social media companies argue that they are, to the messages promulgated through their, through their platforms, what the people who provide the paper are to a newspaper. So you, you would never sue the person 
who provided the paper that a newspaper was printed on for printing something false. But you might sue the people who wrote it, who printed it, and who distributed it. Now, I think that it's incorrect to say that Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and Telegram, and WhatsApp, and all of these other apps are to the information that's that's disseminated on them what the paper is to the newspaper. I think they are participating in a process of, of creating knowledge. And I think it's really important that we draw them into a debate about what it is they're going to do to make sure that this is right, that, that what, they're, what they're, they're disseminating is right. And one of the really frightening things for me is that with Twitter and with Facebook, at least it's public, at least somebody can see what's being said. So if I see something being said that's wrong, I can say, this is wrong. On WhatsApp, it's very, very difficult to know what's spreading. And the, the indication that we have from particularly countries in the global south is that messages spread very rapidly on WhatsApp and on Telegram that cannot be challenged. And that, that's a huge problem. And that's something that requires those networks to cooperate in processes of curating that knowledge. And I think that's a huge change from what they do at the moment. And it also requires some... It's something that requires to be done very, very subtly because we don't want to give the tools to authoritarian regimes that might, may wish to use them to, for instance, suppress dissent in Hong Kong, for instance. Yeah. Um, the, 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 that's, that's part of my anxiety about that process. But I think there's a really important thing here about those networks and their responsibility to truth. Well, it's interesting. Let, let me just turn to some of the questions that are coming in. And just, let me just put this to you, Linda, which is not one about the... The, the specifics of, of research or the analysis of the data, it's, it's really a political question about the damage that is caused. It, it's somebody who wants to be nameless, but is an, an attendee. The damage that can be caused in a society when this person quotes Michael Gove as saying he's fed up of experts, uh, which Gove has tried to come back on, I think, uh, since. But anyway, or when somebody like Dominic Cummings does something which he did going to Barnard Castle to get his eyes tested or whatever it was and indeed Matthew Hancock completely different circumstances leave aside the personal side of it I mean to what extent are these messages from government i.e the leadership of the country uh, important in this context I think they are I think politicians have to be very careful how they communicate particularly in a crisis and just to start with the comment about not needing experts anymore I mean, I think governments um, have become frustrated in a number of scenarios with advice that they get from experts. And Peter gave an example early on of the behavioral fatigue concept, which didn't come from scientists, but probably came from within government using a concept that they didn't understand. And then essentially having it as a tool for a reason why action wasn't taken. And that's deeply unfortunate. Um, so I think I think policymakers and politicians, and I say this as a as a former government advisor and, and somebody who's working with the parliament now, you know, politicians can quite rightly get frustrated with us, the scientists, when we don't necessarily know the answer or we don't communicate it clearly or we don't give them the answer they want to hear. Um, but if you look at public opinion polling in the UK specifically, but also in other countries, in terms of public trust, experts, scientists, uh, clinicians are hugely trusted by the public, far more than politicians, and indeed far more than the media. So the surveys that have been done during the pandemic, the most trusted voices are scientists and also health organisations. So a reputable website like NHS and Forum in Scotland, or uh, messages from the World Health Organisation, who I have to say haven't been perfect on all topics, but they've been, they've been trying their best. So well, that's who the public trust. There's an interesting, I'll keep this with you for a second, Linda, because uh, someone again, uh, not identified by name, has asked this. Mainstream media, which is usually a red flag phrase, but anyway, uh, mainstream media is now saying that COVID might well have come uh, in some fashion from the Wuhan plant, at the Institute of Virology. And then th this person adds, a year ago, people who said this were accused of being conspiracists and so on. So, and they say, well, there you go. You know, things change. Yeah, well, the media also love uh, a controversial story. They love a problem. They love a crisis. And they also love bad news. No offense, Jim. I'm uh, not used to this. Rather I, than good news. Yeah. 
So I can, and they are reporting that now. And I think it's, it's, it's magnifying the issues. Just a couple of points from me on that example sp specifically. A uh, colleague who's posted the question is absolutely right. There was a, a trip to uh, Wuhan with the WHO to investigate back uh, last year what the, what the potential source of, of the virus was, where it had come from, that was quite unclear in terms of its findings and maybe not the access given that that team would have wished. And then we've seen a second investigation, which again, whether all the answers have come out, I don't know. So if you look at the literature, I think that that idea that has been manufactured in a lab is still there. But most scientists, particularly those who have expertise in looking at where uh, diseases that have passed from animals to human, how they have occurred, are pretty convinced that it didn't come from the lab and it may have come from nature. So I think we will see in the fullness of time, and I'm not expert in that area, so I won't comment on it specifically, but back to the media, you're right, the mainstream media are potentially amplifying that because it is controversial and that's often how the media works. We've got a load of questions coming in. Alan Archibald asks this, I'll just read it out because it's, it's quite long, or relatively long. Perhaps surprisingly to the public, social and behavioral scientists you know, members of the expert groups advising the UK and Scottish governments. That expertise is important when modifying people's behaviour and is very critical, sorry, it just jumped up, uh, to navigating the pandemic. Now, Peter suggested that the delay in implementing the first lockdown was a misunderstanding of behavioural social science, some insights from those disciplines. So did the government ignore the advice or were they following the advice of social and behavioural scientists? Uh, and there's clearly going to be a range of views, Alan Archibald suggests, in those disciplines. And, you know, it's one of those moments when you can sympathise with ministers sitting around a table where they've perhaps got a balance of views, different views, but, well, if you do this, the consequences will be this. If you do that, the consequences will be that. You've got to decide which consequences are more acceptable. I just start off, but I will hand over to Peter on this, but just yeah. briefly from me. SPY B, which is the behavioural science group that advises SAGE, that that example did not come from them. We know that from our colleagues on SPY B, right. but you're right, there will have been a variety of other types of advice. But I think the uh, following behavioural science advice, again, my SPY B colleagues would say that the UK government has not, has. there's a number of examples of that not happening, but they need to triangulate it with other evidence. Over to you, Peter. Yes, Peter. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think this, this is a really interesting example. And I, I mean, my understanding of it was that it was actually medics who had misunderstood advice. They'd, they'd read advice across from people who take drugs over, over a period of time. And there's a likelihood that people will become fatigued and will, will stop taking the drugs if you prescribe them for a very long period of time. That is something that, it, that, that is evidenced. They then read that across to will people stick with a lockdown for a long time and said they won't when this when the evidence from social psychology is that it, it simply doesn't simply doesn't support that. Now, I, I think there are interesting things about the structures of government, but I also think there's a really interesting thing about the translation of advice into policy. And I think that advice ran with the grain of what the UK government wanted to do. And that's why they took that advice rather than other advice. Well, and, an interesting um, point that you make there, Peter, because it, it touches on a, a question I'm going to raise here, which comes from Maggie Chapman. And I, I'm interrupting you because I think it follows on rather well. Uh, she says this, is there not something in the fact scientific research about health facts and so on is often written in jargon or she uh, suggests it, it, it's inevitably complicated. And the articles, the articles themselves, which of course may be in, impenetrable to some people, I mean, that's me uh, putting, putting a phrase of my own in, are of course behind paywalls I and mean, you can't just get them. Conspiracies and fake news, of course, are just out there in simple language, um, bold, no pun <laughs> intended, Linda, to you, but I mean, in just in bold words that, you know, oh yeah, well, I'll believe that. Now, how do you get to a point where complex ideas can be better communicated to people so that they can make what we would all describe as rational rather than emotional decisions, Linda? 
Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, let me just start with, with the journals, because I think you've asked a good question. Just to fly the flag for open science, I think it's a major problem that the public cannot see peer-reviewed articles. I mean, you know, often we, we, we've been trained now, scientists, to try and at least make the abstract understandable to people or have a plain English scientific summary. So yeah. people, so anyway, the sooner we can get rid of these paywalls and find another system, I think yeah, is right. So my own personal view, and one of the things I've tried to do throughout my career is irrespective of the discipline that a, a scientist or researcher comes from, we're all trained in some common things, critical thinking um, and critical analysis. And that means we can look at a study, even a study outside of our own discipline actually, and see that there's a common set of methods that have been used and asked, well, are those methods robust and what can or can't we tell from that study? And then I think it's the scientist's responsibility to play a role in having that evidence translate into action of some kind. And now, do, you, do you think that we're going to come on to the role of some scientists who've become public figures just in a second, but there's an interesting question to that. Do you think that one of the outcomes of this, you know, once we've, got through this in one way or another, got through the crisis, is going to be that there is genuinely across the scientific community going to be much more thought about precisely the point you've just raised about communication. It's, it's Surely it's bound to happen. I really hope so, Jim. And that's one of the really, well, one of the good things that might come out of this is that there are hundreds of us in the UK and there are thousands of us around the world who might have done a bit of this in our career and now we're doing it all the time as yeah. in science communication or advising governments. And I think universities now need to step up and recognize, you know, to be frank, it's not valued as highly as the next big paper or the next big grant. So for early career colleagues, and we're doing this with the Royal Society of Edinburgh, I would emphasize here, I think need support and encouragement to do this because I think this is not the last crisis we're going to see, whether you're an economist, a transport expert, or working in public health, you know, we all have a role to play. Well, that's interesting. And Peter, th there's a, a question here from, oh, it's just flicking up. Ralph Armand asks this, or Almond, I, I apologize, maybe Rafe for all I know anyway, <laughs> you know where you are. Has the regular attendance of the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor, I mean the UK ones, the Downey Street briefings, uh, blurred that line, we're talking about balance and witty here, we've become, you know, huge public figures between science and politics. And of course, lying behind that interesting question is, well, if they didn't go there, they wouldn't have had the impact they had. But the minute they do go there, you are sort of tied up, whether you like it or not, in the political decision, even if it's one that you might have had a little bit of doubt about in the way it's expressed, interpolating after the question, but it that's where it gets us, isn't it? And I actually think this has been really good. I mean, I, I think for pe people seeing experts on their TV communicating with them about their expertise, is, has been one of the best things about uh, the pandemic. Especially and I think you can do it more clearly and persuasively than the minister standing alongside them, or indeed well, the prime minister. Some, sometimes they're helped by the minister's uh, lack of communication skills, which is something, of course, we think the politicians are meant to have. But I, I mean, I, I think, you know, looking at things like the public's understanding of concepts like the R number, we, you know, we've really come quite a long way. And I think one of the things that I would love to see come out of this, and to go back to the question from a moment ago, I would love to see us, I, I mean, one of, I think one of the duties that the people who've made billions out of social media may well be, I, I would like one of them to buy out the the scientific publishers and make everything open i think they have the money to do it i think that 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 would be something useful for zuckerberg's billions and i think it would be a real contribution to humanity and i think the second thing i i, I would love to see in that space is us using all of the creative talents that we've got out there to do some communication of this stuff i watched a video that i stumbled across on the internet about how 5g causes covid and it was fantastically made. It was absolute nonsense, but it was fantastically made nonsense. It looked like the quality of a TV documentary. And I can see how people who judge the quality of information on the quality of production would be taken in by it. 
And I don't see why we're not putting more resource into, into, into using all of the creative people we have out there to deliver that, that knowledge in that fantastically produced way. Well, here, I'm going to stay with you just for a second, Peter, because we've got a question here from left field, as it were, or actually it's probably right field. But anyway, Richard Burton uh, says, what do you do? He asks this. When it is the BBC spreading the misinformation, now hold on to your seats, I refer to cycle helmets, which the BBC has been peddling apparently, uh, for 40 years. Um, wow. Complaining has proved fruitless and they simply refuse to report the facts. Now, I don't know what, you know, Mr. Burton's obviously in, in a position where he, uh, he knows what the facts are uh, to his mind and he thinks other people don't respect the same facts or accept them. But I mean, there's an example of someone saying, look, you have, you have a public broadcaster now, I can tell Mr. Burton that there's no policy on these things. I mean, nobody rings up and says he can't say anything bad about a bike helmet. I mean, that, such things don't exist. But if you think that there's a kind of feeling that you can't object to people wearing bike helmets and therefore it becomes, you know, a fact which is promulgated, he doesn't believe it. Why does he have to swallow it from a public broadcaster? I mean, it's a serious question. I'm not sure which side of that debate the BBC are. Uh, meant to be well, on. Think, well, it shouldn't be on either side of a debate. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm somebody who's quite interested in that debate. And I've never noticed a BBC slant on that particularly, but I think it is. I think it's a. It, it actually is a really interesting debate, and it's one of the ones that where you juxtapose the risk posed to the individual, where if they come off their bike, they're better served having a cycle helmet on, with the the, the reduction in risk that comes with more people cycling which is associated with people not wearing cycle helmet. And there's a really interesting uh, set of discussions there that I think we could usefully have facilitated. Now, it's a, it's a bit of a niche argument, that, I, I, I would say. But I also think there's, there's something about, about public broadcasters here, and I think this is probably the nub of the question, which is that it's really important that we distinguish between the facts that inform a discussion and the public policy outcomes from that discussion. And I think all too often people move too quickly from the underpinning facts and the science to the public policy conclusions. Uh, I mean, to give you an example, I, I remember reading a paper about smoking, where there were pages and pages of statistical analysis of the impact of smoking on uh, individual health. And the conclusion, which was three lines long, said, therefore, we should increase taxes, taxes on cigarettes. And I thought that that's a great example of you pulling a public policy solution out of a lot of analysis, none of which pointed to the impact of taxation on, on tobacco, which, you know, may be things like more smuggling and therefore less control over the supply of cigarettes. And I, and I think those are the sorts of things that, that a public service broadcaster should be investigating. But we need a very clear division of the facts. Well, there's an interesting question here from David Watson, which is very much to the point and, and mercifully brief. And it's simply this. We know a lot about the problems. What are the solutions? Now, you talked a moment ago, Linda, about perhaps one of the consequences of the pandemic being a mature discussion about these questions and about communications, about communication. Uh, do you think that's where the answer lies? That, in other words, what we've got to do is to make sure that uh, people who are driven to despair by what they regard as unfounded conspiracy theories and fake news and all the rest of it, don't just stand there tearing their hair out on television, but take it on point by point. I think that's right. I, I would say David's raised a really good point. Scientists are better, and this includes in public health, at diagnosing a problem and describing the problem. So we describe a disease or, as Peter's just said, the harms of smoking, et cetera. That's sort of what we're trained to do. A lot of it is the, the etiology of something rather than here's what you should do about it. Because often scientists regard that as a policymaker's role or a clinician's role or whatever. And also the type of research that's needed to interrogate a solution, often implementation research is not is really not supported. But to, to, just to interrupt you there, and this comes back to the question that we had a moment ago about the, the chief medical officer and the chief scientific uh, guy being, you know, side by side with the prime minister. 
if you've got that display of the political decision-making apparatus in terms of lockdowns, social distancing, whatever it is, alongside what the scientists are saying, they're saying, look, here is the graph, here's the R number, here is what we are saying the choices are. You've then got the political figure who is responsible for making the choices saying, and on the balance of evidence, this is what we've decided to do. Surely, whether you think Mr. or Miss X or Mr. or Miss Y is an impressive communicator, that's actually a much more rational and helpful way of discussing policy to the public, because you're saying, look, here's what the scientists are putting into the sausage machine, and it's being cracked by the politician. Here's what's come out. Do you think they've made the right decision? Which is actually a much clearer way of looking at it than it would be if you never saw the scientists at all. I think that's right. And I think that the, as Peter said before, the pairing of the advisor, the expert with the politician, even if, let's face it, either or both of them are not great communicators, yeah. is better. And I don't think, I think you do need the, I, I do think you need the experts on the platform to describe it. Because at the end of the day, advisors really very clearly, and it's in our brief, you know, our job is to advise, is to interrogate the data, offer solutions, the politicians have to make the decisions. But just one final point briefly on that, Jim. What the public also wants to know is what's the black box in the middle? So what are the things that the politician also considered to interrogate or interpret the scientist's advice and come up with a solution? And often the public don't get that information. And I think that frustrates people. And do you think, Peter, that that might be because in some circumstances there are rather cruder things at work, namely, you know, politics, survival, you know, a by-election or a, whatever it happens to be. So, I mean, I think this is, uh, the pandemic has been an example of where politics hasn't been so subjected to political uh, forces. So we had, you know, an enormous bounce for every government in power at the start. You had this sort of rally around the flag effect. And so they were somewhat insulated from the very direct bumpiness of you made a decision and we don't like it there's a by-election coming up next week there weren't by-elections governments were being trusted by their people and i think it, i mean it's really interesting we, we did a hack and it's supported by almost all of the polling evidence the clearer the politicians were and and the more consistent they were the more supported they were by the public. And I think the deep contrast between the Scottish administration and the, and the UK administration was not so much in the quality of the decision making and much more in the consistency of the decision making. And that's what gave people confidence. And certainly when we did research, direct research, what we found was that people's what people really objected to was the changing of situations. So saying we're, we're, we're going to have Freedom Day on the 21st of June. No, we're not. And that is what has been catastrophic. And I and I, the the communication by other government figures has been much, much more successful because there hasn't been that inconsistency. And I think that's probably the big learning point out of this. There's a couple of... I mean, all sorts of people are, are piling in on this and saying, you know, for example, you can't expect uh, people to take things on trust when you look back and, you know, those of us of a certain age remember thalidomide and so on, you know, so you, you can't take things on trust all the time. But there are a couple of related questions here, one from David Price saying, do you think the understanding of risk comes in part from a natural human inability to understand and conceptualize the differences between large numbers, you know, one in a hundred as compared with 303 million? Is a, is a different kind of calculation and, and people find that a bit difficult. And Becky Kendall asks completely separately a, a related question, which is this. Do you think part of the cause of the whole question we're discussing is the erosion of state education so that people don't have the skills to evaluate either risk or the validity of information? I mean, there is a fundamental question there about numbers and the way that, if you like, experts, to use Govian technology terminology, explain something which to them is so obvious and clear but to many people for whom you know basic arithmetical literacy is quite low it's quite tricky Linda yeah I mean so 
it's about absolute and relative risk. Those are actually difficult concepts to communicate. You mentioned David Spiegelhalter, who's built a whole center, a Winton Center at Cambridge around trying to improve this. But there's been so many instances in the pandemic when that's not been done well. And, and just to give you one specific example, non-COVID, work of my own on smoking in pregnancy. If you try to communicate to a woman what is the risk of smoking to her baby, you can tell her the population figures, but what she wants to know is what's the risk to her definitely. And yeah. actually, I can't tell her that because I don't know enough about her circumstances. And maybe her mum smoked and her grandmother smoked and everybody was fine. So the other thing that interplays in that is not just the quantification, but people want stories they want immediate understanding of what is relevant to their lives and sometimes they find information from their communities and their peers going back to peter's point about certain communities more reliable than objective numbers that are difficult to understand i think there's also a point here about the way in which we communicate numbers and i think you presenting me with a set of numbers i'm reasonably numerate in this in this context and i'm whizzing my head's whizzing and i'm trying to work out what what that means we can visualize numbers we now have the tools to do data visualization in a way that we just didn't before that's really really helpful and i mean i think back to the point at which people were concerned about blood clots with the astrazeneca vaccine somebody pointed out that of course the risk to women from the contraceptive pill is much 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 higher of, of getting blood clots repeatedly you, you could go on instagram and you could see 10 or 20s of people sharing infographics showing just what that risk looked like which which really helped people to conceptualize a both how risky the contraceptive pill is relative to the, the vaccine but also how relatively safe the vaccine is. And, and I, th I think that's something that we really need to harness an awful lot better is these ways of visualization that help people to understand things that it's very difficult to understand when presented verbally. Uh, underlying this, and there are a lot of questions and things coming on. I've had a, a response, by the way, from Richard Burton of, of Cycle Helmet fame earlier on saying that the BBC need to look at this because the rather splendid programme, more or less, which of course has had a fantastic run during the pandemic, uh, did a thing which he thinks very strongly supported his view and he believes that the editorial guidelines have been breached and I'm just going to say this without getting into a discussion about it, I'd be very happy to raise the questions that he, that he raises because he feels very strongly about it. But there's a fundamental point here, which is that, you know, we all realise that some of these sensational or troubling conspiracy theories, whether they're at the extreme QAnon end or whether they're just a mild distrust of authority, are pervasive and they spread like wildfire because of social media, which never happened in that way before. Fundamentally, and we're coming to the end of our time, what is the best way to deal with something which we all accept, and people will have different views and different aspects of the pandemic, but we all accept that it's a problem in having a rational discussion which will lead to, you know, the most beneficial solutions. So just for the two of you, and by the way, Mariana says people can email her at the BBC. She had to go and do a report for Newsnight, and she apologises for leaving. But I want to finish by asking the two of you to say fundamentally what do you think should be done to help to combat this peter first and then linda so i i think i think there are three things here there's a supply side question which is we should be supplying the best information publicly and in a way that's that that's as comprehensible as possible there's a demand side question which is that we should be trying to find ways to increase people's ability to use that information and their ability to participate in the use of that information so we should be more participatory about how people get involved in in decision making and i think there's something structural here which is that we're in a new era of information social media poses problems that we didn't have before and it also creates opportunities that we didn't have before and we we really need to to use that participation to create new ways 
of regulating and communicating through social media. And I think one for me, one of the quickest wins would be for social media companies to own up to being publishers and start behaving like their publishers rather than ducking that question. But I think there are also really exciting possibilities for the communication of knowledge through social media if we can get away from conspiracy theories and things that are on evidence. And surely that whole question of big tech, as it's now known um, widely, is managed, if you like, supervised, or perhaps not supervised, but certainly regulated in the next generation is, is one of the absolutely pressing political questions. I mean, you won't see it in the front page of the newspapers every day, but certainly in the States and, and more and more here. Linda, just your observations on where we go from here. Yeah, just very briefly, because um, Peter has highlighted the key, the key sort of solutions or the broad categories, you need a strategy. But I would just make a point about speed, and it goes back to the discussion we were having earlier. The difference nowadays, in the old days, you would write, publish something, another researcher would then challenge it in a journal, they'd write a letter to the editor, media might pick it up. Now it's happening in an instant uh, instance, and the conspiracies will spiral and go viral incredibly quickly and if we lose time in, counter, in, in, in counteracting them it makes it even worse. So scientists, researchers, universities, the media etc they need to be able to get the accurate information out quickly and, and resource the system to do that on a variety of platforms and I think a lot of it as I say final point will be about the next generation of scientists and researchers coming up being encouraged to play their part. One of the things I mentioned earlier that a sort of reg, a red flag is the phrase mainstream media, which is usually used by people who say that all of us in you know, newspapers, magazines, radio and television are involved on the same side of an argument. I mean, it's manifestly false. But anyway, mainstream media is, is used as a kind of general insult. You could argue that the mainstream media now, the last word, Peter, is in fact, you know, consists of Facebook, and all the other social outlets they're the mainstream well absolutely and I, I mean i think it's really interesting the bbc is one of the few websites that we that people will type into a browser uh window and go to directly most information comes to you mediated through some other platform facebook twitter whatsapp all of those all of those other apps and those those people really need to step up to the responsibilities that they've got at the moment because some of them twitter isn't profitable but a lot of them are very profitable and they really should be applying some of that profits back into the business which they are in which is the curation and spread of knowledge well we're back to that question as to whether the kinds of questions we're discussing and have been discussing for the last hour are uh, tied up with the profit motive and of course sometimes they are um on behalf of the Royal Society of Edinburgh two fellows Peter McCall and Linda Bold uh, thank you very much for joining this contribution that the RSE has tried to make to the Edinburgh Science Festival which is such a um, you know a, a font of kind of wisdom and rationality and we hope those of you who've joined have enjoyed it I'm asked by the RSE to say that questions can be fed through the RSE it's easy to find the website and passed on not just to our two panelists here but to Mariana who sadly had to go because of broadcasting equipment uh, I'm sorry I've appeared to be in the TARDIS here but I am at work so there we are that's the way it is but Peter McCall Linda Bold thank you both very much from the Royal Society of Edinburgh to the Science Festival good luck with the Leicester Festival and thank you very much indeed for joining us goodbye Thank you. Thanks, Jim.